The last topic we're going to talk about is shock. And you don't get shock studying for the USMLE. And what do we define it clinically? Is shock is characterized by vascular collapse and widespread hypoperfusion of cells and tissues in the body. And because of this reduced blood flow volume or the cardiac output or vascular tone where you decrease perfusion because you need to maintain a perfusion state that's dependent upon the blood pressure. And the easy way to remember this, and this is where you can bring your physiology, think of the formula for blood pressure equals what? Cardiac output, which equals what? The stroke volume times heart rate times the total per peripheral resistance. If one of these are affected, blood pressure is decreased and there, therefore leading to hypoperfusion. And now what are going to happen to the cells? They go from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state and you develop a metabolic acidosis and cellular injury leading to ultimately death. The cell injury in shock is initially reversible because the biochemical changes always precede the morphologic changes and when the cells obviously are starting to die, depending upon the reserve of cells in the tissue, it can be a point of irreversibility clinically and the patient will succumb to it and lead to death. And so this becomes important in how you look at shock. Let's look at the major causes of shock. What's going to decrease the ability to perfuse tissue globally throughout the body? One, if the pump fails, we call this cardiogenic shock. What are some causes? Things like if you part of the heart dies during a myocardial infarction, if you have a arrhythmia like from cocaine usage, or if you have an MI that leads to an arrhythmia, remember 90% of all myocardial infarcts can lead to a lethal arrhythmia. If you have a massive pulmonary embolus, that can decrease blood flow to the left side and therefore lead to decreased perfusion through the arterial side, leading to shock and cellular injury, ultimately death. If you have rupture of the heart, like in a myocardial infarct, leading to blood accumulating in the pericardial sac, it can lead to cardiac tamponade, or if you have fluid accumulating from other causes, uh, infection, that can also diminish the ability of the heart to fill and therefore leading to decreased perfusion and leading to shock. A second cause is hypovolemic shock, where you have decreased uh, blood volume. What are some common things that can lead to it? Obvious things like hemorrhage, fluid loss secondary to severe burns where you increase the vascular permeability, severe dehydration. And what do we think of that? What can lead to severe dehydration? Obviously decreased intake of water, or if you have patients that have nausea and vomiting that will de diminish the, vol the volume within the intravascular space as well as diarrhea. And so what are the two groups of people that are vulnerable to this? Are the very young, infants, children, and older individuals. Another important cause of shock is septic shock or bacterial infection. We think of gram-negative sepsis where you have endotoxin damaging blood vessel walls leading to vasodilatation and extravasation of the blood cells possibly depending on how severe the vasculopathy that's a, a, in response to that exposure to endotoxin. These endotoxins in the circulation will result in the production of cytokines. It'll stimulate the macrophage. You can see by this list, tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, IL-8, IL-6. Will lead to vasodilatation and hypotension, further exacerbating the process of perfusion to tissue. And then because the endotoxin will damage endothelial cells that are out the intravascular space, it can also damage those in the capillary bed within the alveolar walls, leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And releasing tissue factor and exposing the underlying collagen in the base membrane leading to DIC. And then eventually what's going to happen is multi-system organ dysfunction or multi-system organ failure leading to ultimately to death. Another important cause of shock is neurogenic. And how is neurogenic shock? Well, if you think about the central nervous system, it's going to control the autonomic nervous system. Well, what controls peripheral resistance is sympathetic tone. So if you have loss of sympathetic tone, you're now going to uh, lead to the decreased total peripheral resistance. So people who have spinal cord injuries or under general anesthesia, what happens to your blood pressure when you're under general anesthesia is decreased uh, total peripheral uh, resistance is 
decreased and therefore you have hyperperfusion. Another important cause is a hypersensory reaction type 1 is anaphylactic shock where you get generalized vasodilatation because of the massive release of histamine and other vasodilators uh, from mast cells exposed to an allergen that triggers this release. So the stages of shock. There's stage 1, obviously. This is going to be the body's response to the decreased perfusion. What would you expect to see? Increased sympathetic tone, the release of catecholamine stress from the adrenal glands that will uh, cause vasoconstriction, trying to increase blood pressure and maintain perfusion to vital tissues in the body. You're going to activate, as you well know from physiology, the renin-angiotensin system to, as well as the mineral corticoid to retain sodium and increase the vascular volume to maintain perfusion. The second stage, despite these reflexive mechanisms to maintain perfusion, you'll lead to a situation where they're not enough and you have decompensation. And this decompensation is going to lead to decreased perfusion and now you're going to go from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state and you know from biochemistry that glycolysis is not a very good way if, or efficient way of producing enough ATP to meet the metabolic needs of tissues, especially like neurons, cardiac, tubular cells, and the kidney. Then at this point, it's still reversible because you've only had biochemical changes. And again, as I mentioned, you're going to go to a metabolic acidosis, electrolyte imbalances because the kidney is going to start to be injured because you're developing acute tubular necrosis. If this persists, we're going to have to worry about the problem of stage 3 or ultimately cell death and organ failure within those cells that make up the tissues. Now when we talk about the shock or reflex and shock, you have to think of basically in the brainstem you have vasomotor center in the medulla obligata that will increase sympathetic output increased heart rate, which is obviously going to affect blood pressure. Obviously, uh, stroke volume will be increased as a consequence of this, increased cardiac output, and increased total peripheral resistance. And because of the decreased blood pressure, the barrel receptors in the carotid sinus and aortic arch will stimulate cranial nerves 9 and 10 that will now stimulate the brainstem to allow to try to compensate for this. So this would be in stage 1 of shock. When we talk about the pathology of shock, we think of kidneys, we call it shock kidneys, but really what we're talking about is acute tubular necrosis because remember that the tubular cells have a lot of mitochondria, it's a very active metabolic cells, carry out many physiologic and biochemical processes that are critical to renal function, so they'll end up dying first. And we call this clinically acute renal failure, but because this, the tubular cells have are stable cells, they have capacity to regenerate and reestablish renal function. And obviously when you have ATN, you'll see this later when it's, uh, when you talk about ATN in the kidney, you're going to have decreased urinary output because what happens is the tubular cells die, they will occlude the tubular uh, lumen and prevent outflow. And then you get obviously tubular function like electrolytes will not be able to be maintained gradients and you get imbalances occurring. In the lung, you cause damage to the endothelial cells within the capillary lumen of the alveolar walls leading to shock lung or diffuse alveolar damage or ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. The intestines, as I mentioned before, the mucosa is vulnerable. It's the last place to get oxygen. So if you have shock, no perfusion, you're going to get mucosal damage and you'll get what is called superficial mucosal ischemic necrosis. And remember, in the colon, it can be one of the mechanisms that leads to pseudomembranous colitis as ischemia. Often you're taught that pseudomembranous colitis is due to Clostridium difficile, which is another cause of pseudomembranous colitis, and it's because of change in the normal flora because of antibiotic usage. But another cause of pseudomembranous colitis is ischemic. The prolonged damage to the intestinal wall is very critical because how many cell layers is the from the uh, GE junction or gastroesophageal junction down to the anus is one cell layer thick. So if this cell layer is necrotic, what's going to get into the bloodstream is your bacterial flora, gram-negative rods, cocci, you name it, whatever the flora is. And now you can lead to, this is called translocation, and this can lead to uh, septic shock. The liver, 
the, the zone three of the liver is the last place to get oxygen. You can develop shock liver or central lobular necrosis. Then in the case of Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, remember that's due to meningococcal septicemia, where you due to meningitis or basically septicemia where the Neisseria meningitis organism gets into the bloodstream and it can lead to bilateral acute hemorrhagic infarction of the adrenal glands, further uh, decreasing the ability to make important hormones like cortisol that's important for maintaining blood pressure, for example, and leading to further decreased perfusion. So you will develop what we call clinically acute adrenal insufficiency or acute adrenal crisis. Here's the pathophysiology of shock when we talk about it in this diagram in your syllabus. You get inadequate perfusion. The most common cause of cell injury is hypoxia. Obviously, you're not able to make enough ATP from your mitochondria, so you're not going to be able to uh, sustain important biochemical pathways, and you develop lactic acidosis, so what's going to happen to the pH? It's going to be decreasing, so you're going to an anaerobic metabolism. This metabolic acidosis can trigger vasoconstriction and obviously further diminishing blood flow to the tissue, leading to further ischemic injury. Then as a function of time, the metabolic acidosis will lead to cell membrane dysfunction and what's going to happen because you can't make enough ATP, you will uh, accumulate sodium in the cell because remember sodium is high outside the cell and it requires sodium potassium ATPase and so now sodium comes in, water comes in causing uh, disruption to the organelles and swelling of the tissue and then as the pH drops, lysosomal enzymes will become activated because there are a lot of acid hydrolases and will cause damage. And then further release of substances into the intravascular space from this damaged tissue will damage endothelium, leading to further disruption and lead to decreased perfusion. It can lead to thrombosis formation, stasis of blood, and further aggravating the process of shock leading to ultimately death of the patient. So this has been an overview of circulatory pathology and this will be used over and over again as we go through the various organ systems. So these are important processes you need to understand as well as define and apply them in various clinical scenarios, especially when you take the USMLE.